sisters, brothers, friends, we gather in celebration to this morning. Home. and for tech support that is present all along. <laughs> you may notice that Richard is not here this morning. I ask uh, that we hold prayer. Um, Terry was on the floor this morning. Um, his blood sugar is very low. Um, Richard is attending to him in an emergency status. And so um, we are making a few changes to to the order of worship. Um, thanks to some videos that we have, uh, there, there's more that is intact in our normal order of worship than, than is changed. Um, but our prelude this morning, uh, which is not even listed in the bulletin, will be um, My Heart Ever Faithful. And our opening hymn is, instead of Come We That Love the Lord, is Come Let Us All Unite to Sing. It will be video, but for anyone who wants to follow along, it is number 12 in the bulletin. As we gather today, what other announcements do you wish to share? Because it won't go through unless it's through the microphone. Just a reminder, we have a board meeting this Tuesday. I just did an email today as well. This is more, not an announcement, but if you would like a pianist for any of the hymns, I would be happy to do my best. Ah, well, thank you. It's up to you. I don't <laughs> want to change anything that you've already changed. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, You are the one who is doing the tech pieces, Greg. What's easiest for you at this point? Probably just keep it the way it is. Probably just keep it the way it is. Okay. <laughs> but thank you, Mimi. That's what I love about this congregation. It's sort of like, here I am. I can help out. It's Stacy in the back. Just a quick reminder, my concert with Mechanicsburg Ecumenical Choir is today at 3 o'clock at St. Joe's. Catholic Church in Mechanicsburg. And you all are welcome. All the money um, that is raised today will go to New Hope Ministries. Awesome. Thank you, Stacy. And it's in your bulletin, but a reminder that tomorrow at 2 o'clock, uh, we're having Lauren France's memorial service. There are no other announcements. Oh, yes, Jim. Yeah, I didn't mention it, but I'll drop it off. Oh, that's okay. Uh, there's Ryan Dyke Marshall from Mission Grace and Balance. As a concerned to present this painting, I don't know what to do. We will celebrate that in joys and concerns, but glad for Ryan getting his Maybe doctorate. Let us, let us continue in a spirit of worship with our prelude, My Heart Ever Faithful.
please stand for the call to worship. And it's printed on the back of your bulletin. In the midst of creation, God's dwelling is here. In the midst of our mourning, God's dwelling is here. In the midst of our crying, God's dwelling is here. In the midst of our pain, God's dwelling is here. In the midst of our joy, God's dwelling is here. In all things, God's, God's dwelling, dwelling is here. <laughs> God of creation, we thank you for the beauty of the earth and the ways it reflects your handiwork. We ask your forgiveness for the ways we have disregarded which you have made, treating it as a tool for our own ends. You have promised to dwell among us, making your home among mortals in the new heaven and the new earth. Until then, dwell with us now as we gather to worship you this day. In the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Jesus speaks of being glorified as God has been glorified in him. Jesus tells them that he is about to leave them and where he is going, they cannot come. However, Jesus has given them a new commandment that they love one another just as he has loved them. I'll be reading from John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. 
When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look, look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John of Patmos beholds a vision of a new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. The first heaven and earth have passed away. The sea is no more. Then John witnesses the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, and the division of heaven and earth is no more as God's home is now among humanity. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Our God is making all things new Every woman, every man, every creature, every land Our God is making all Things new come alive, come alive, come and be made new. Let's we'll sing that together. Our God is making all things new.
That is Seth Hendricks from annual conference of several years ago. Two weeks ago, as some of you are well aware, Kara and Eliana, along with the rest of the cast and crew of Susicle, wrapped up their shows from Susquehanna Township, and thanks to those who were part of it. The musical, if you aren't aware, is based on Dr. Seuss characters, especially the cat and the hat and Hort and the elephant. And a recurring theme throughout the musical is the worth of each creature, each who. And believing in your worth without trying to be something that you're not. Part of valuing worth is caring for others even when it means self-sacrifice. Now, there is nothing overtly Christian or even spiritual about this musical, and yet its message resonates with scriptures that we have heard, especially the passage from John. Over the last few weeks, I've been thinking about how the lessons from the musical connect to the gospel that we proclaim. Love is the key to finding hope in the darkest times. But before we get there, there's another message in Susicle that might help us to connect Jesus' words in John with this vision of new heaven and new earth that we hear from Revelation. They are part of the same lectionary text for this day, but they might not seem to have a whole lot in common. Susicle, likewise, combines characters and storylines that Dr. Seuss himself might never have imagined being in dialogue with one another. The world of the Who's is drifting through space, but it also has environmental troubles, disaster through the chopping down of truffle trees, and threats of war over whether toast should be butter side up or butter side down. Military leaders drill cadets with a refrain of, I do not like green eggs and ham, I do not like them, Sam, I am. <laughs> Those who know the stories may recognize these references. But to the characters in the musical, they don't know beyond their own stories. And what we might miss if we aren't paying close attention is that every one of these stories in their fullness finds resolution in looking past one's own perspective and view of the world to embrace something new, something larger, something more. A concern for environmental protection, an increased tolerance for what is different, a willingness to try something new, leads to an understanding of the world that is less about either or and more about both and. <laughs> Theodore Geisel, the man better known as Dr. Seuss, was perhaps not able to fully grasp that message himself. One of the criticisms of his books is racist stereotypes that appear through many of his stories. And yet this message of curiosity and trying to overcome adversity shines beyond the limitations of the messenger. So we might, be do, well, might do well to hold that in mind as we try to speak the gospel and show others the kind of love that Jesus himself instructed his disciples to proclaim. The words that you heard Carol read from John's gospel follow a story that we as brethren hold particularly near and dear and live out in love feasts through foot washing. Jesus was in the world, but he knew the time was coming for him to leave the world. And that part of the text says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. After washing the disciples' feet, Jesus declared a new commandment that they love one another as he has loved them. We receive the scripture as new teaching, but it isn't really new. The message had been present throughout Torah, both written and oral. Loving God and loving neighbor, 
were linked as two sides of the greatest commandment. We show love for God through the ways that we show love for one another. Jesus made this message explicit, but it had been present throughout the scriptures and the teachings of the law all along. The Hebrew scriptures tell of caring for widows and orphans, for resident aliens in their midst, for loosening bonds that prevent people from experiencing freedom of all types. The entirety of the Gospels and a central theme throughout the Bible is a leading of people toward wholeness and healing. And so as Jesus knew, there was a time that was coming when he would not be with the disciples in person. He wanted them to be able to live out this message. He had been entrusting them to them all along. He said they could not come where he was going. But in following this commandment, they would always have him with them. What was new about this instruction was an opening to seeing that as they loved one another, they would see Christ in their midst. It wasn't just for those who were part of Jesus's inner circle. It would expand. In fact, everyone from the author's acclamation would be able to recognize Jesus's disciples by the love that they show for one another. In English, we merge understandings of love into a single word, but as you may know, in Greek, it is agape love, the kind of love that God shows. It's different from the love that we might have for a, for a friend or a romantic partner. These other forms of love can be compromised by others' actions or even by our own moods and feelings. There are limits to the love that we might show toward a neighbor, towards friends, towards lovers. And there are even seasons where that love and connection may ebb or flow. Jesus' disciples had had about three years together. And we can see some places in the scriptures where they experienced rivalry vibing for special attention and distinction among each other. There were times when some of the disciples were called out as particular leaders, and some have a closer relationship with Jesus. But this commandment was to all of them who were gathered in the room. Now, Judas had already left, but those who were remaining we're going to carry out his mission and his ministry. We can imagine that all they had experienced over their time with Jesus led them to see each other as friends, even as brothers. Of course, some of them literally were brothers or had had connections prior to Jesus' arrival in their lives. But some of them might never have associated one, with one another had it not been for Jesus who came and said, come and see and follow me. We who are part of the church today might recognize that it is Christ who is our common bond. Some of us would be naturally drawn to each other and some of us likewise might find little in common were it not for Christ's call. In some ways, the years that the disciples spent with Jesus didn't do much for their questions about who it was that they were following. They called him Lord and even Messiah, but they didn't fully recognize the vision for God's reign that Jesus was putting before them. They could only recognize Jesus here and now, right before them. This talk of Jesus going away and them carrying on was beyond their grasp of understanding. But Jesus was trying to teach them to love. And only by love could they understand what it meant for Jesus to be with them no matter where they were. 
love. Not just a feeling of warmth for people who saw the world in the same way, but a way of living and patterning life that connected people they might not otherwise choose to be around with the strongest force that Jesus could offer to them. And it would challenge them to live out his teachings to their fullest. The kind of love he was initiating would be revealed on the cross when he forgave even those who were responsible for his death. The disciples didn't live that message fully. And if we're honest with ourselves, there are times when we too fail to live as fully as Jesus taught and modeled. In the biblical witness, years passed, and the church that began with Jesus' followers grew. As believers proclaimed Jesus as Lord, officials of the state became less tolerant of these beliefs. The early church suffered under Roman rule. Early Christians were persecuted, and they sometimes paid for their faith with their very lives. The book of Revelation often misunderstood for its apocalyptic visions and misused as a way to simply predict the future, addresses persecution, and imagines both a time of suffering and of glorious restoration. In the verses you heard nearly at the end of the book, all of the suffering has come to an end. The new Jerusalem has come to earth and God has promised to be with people for all time. The image of God wiping away tears is often isolated in verses shared in funeral and memorial services. But it comes after descriptions of people who have struggled who have tried to make sense of violence in a world that doesn't often make sense. We might identify with some of those questions and concerns today. When we see and hear of violence in the world that, thanks to technology, has been brought very near to us, and yet in our practical living seems so far. We can identify with some of the feelings of those in Revelation, but the book itself is not an easy one to tackle. Some try to associate references to specific events or people. Some use it as a checklist to determine the end of days with a hope that after these specific things occur, then Jesus will return and set the world right. But we live two millennia after these visions and our view of the world itself is very different from the first century. Even without these differences of time and location, it's hard to understand or to know what was meant to be taken literally and what was metaphor. If we read actions without awareness of what was going on and the power of symbols and connections to Hebrew scriptures, we miss a lot of the context of the book as it was originally designed for worship. All these realities may help us to understand why Revelation isn't used in the lectionary, the three-year cycle of readings, very often. In fact, the only time when chunks of Revelation are used you know, week after week is year C, where we are, in weeks following Easter. Those who created the lectionary apparently thought it would be important to know how was this message of the risen Christ lived out in the early church in the midst of their successes and their failures. In understanding Revelation, I am grateful for Bernard Eller's book on Revelation, the most revealing book in the Bible because most references I hear to Revelation from other sources focus on this battle of heavenly and demonic forces with metaphors that seem out of sync with the realities we know today. Eller, on the other hand, asserts that the battle was over before it began. Christ's death on the cross 
his enduring love conquered all forces of death and destruction. Read alongside Jesus' commands in John, it doesn't make sense to me that Christ would be eager to engage in a willful destruction of life or to tell others to do so or to separate people into allies and enemies. And this message of love is the one that pervades the gospel. The signs and symbols in Revelation point to a time long ago, but is thought to take place sometime in the future. As we move further into a world in which these visions were first shared, it's hard to see how they fit into our gospel message today. And yet the hope of it remains that at the completion of God's work, God is with us, here and now, who continues to renew and recreate us. The book is named as something to happen in the future and at the end of apocalyptic visions. God will come and bring the new heaven and the new earth. All that has been a source of sorrow and suffering will be wiped away and replaced with the way the world was originally meant to be, restored to the perfection of creation. We may envision life after death as going to heaven, leaving the earth and going to a place where people are whole and healthy and free from all troubles. Revelation speaks of the new Jerusalem revealing God with us here. Without going to an envisioned heaven, we connect even now with what is divine. We get stuck in a linear sense of time, and we make sense of time by trying to understand the space that we're in. We can be here or there, but we haven't figured out how to be in more than one place at once. In the limits of our understanding, we sometimes forget that God isn't bound by the rules that govern our lives. God is neither here nor there, in one time or another, in one place or another. God is present throughout and beyond all history and markers of space or land. Just as Jesus was present with his disciples in that final meal, Jesus was also present with them following the resurrection, with the early church and the struggles they experienced and throughout history and with us today. Part of the message of Revelation is that God has never left us. Heaven and earth unite as one in the imagined new Jerusalem. There God makes God's home with us. Then and now, here and there, combine in one understanding of God's presence throughout all humanity. And all are brought together by this incredible and enduring message of love. Like the characters who come alive and interact with each other in Susical, faithful imagination carries us into conversation with Jesus' disciples and with the early church. We can see places where we've been open to new insight and where we get stuck in our own stories, refusing to open ourselves to ongoing revelation. Jesus' offer and answer to this temptation is to love. Show God's love to one another. Live it out in our words and our actions. Care for the ones who are neglected or persecuted. Trust that when we are the ones who feel persecuted, that God will sustain us. There in the first century, here in the 21st century, we are united as God's creation. And God is continuing to care for us in this image of a new heaven and a new earth where we get glimpses of it even now. It's not defined by who we destroy or what we don't understand but how willing we are to engage in God's creative power, to envision a world of peace, 
to respond to Christ's radical call, even for the least among us. To imagine, to re-envision and borrow from the words of Susical, oh, the things we can think when we are willing to see as God sees, to hear as God hears, to love as God loves, across the miles and across the years. May it be so. For our special music today, Jacob Krause, who is a, a talented young adult in the Church of the Brethren, has, has offered his gifts of music um, and his ability in playing several instruments. Um, so you will see him <laughs> playing several at the same time. It is the same, it is one person, not triplets. Um, but this traditional Zulu text and music is offered as a gift from Jacob Krauss. Love is calling now to everyone here in this place. Love is calling out. Will you go for me? Will you go for me? Love is calling. 
is calling He's calling out to everyone here in this place Love is calling out Will you go for me? Will you go for me? In this place, let us come together in a time of prayer. Oh God, we are grateful for the ways that you reveal yourself to us, for opportunities to travel, and for safety in returning home. We're glad to have the Fabers back home and glad to have Linda Giesemann at home and glad to have Micah at home, even as he prepares to travel to, to Europe with the choir tour this week. Oh God, as technology has brought our world ever closer, as we are able within a span of hours to cover significant parts of the globe, we know that you are with us in each place. We're glad for technology that allows us to connect from a distance, to be aware of what's going on in the world. It brings us a bit closer to one another and yet we confess that we can get stuck in our own communities and lives and neighborhoods. And even within neighborhoods, we might not know each other very well. Expr expand our awareness of what's going on in not only the lives of those that we name and list and hold in our hearts, but your people in the world everywhere those who are struggling to survive amidst war, amidst disagreements, amidst natural disasters and famines. We pray for those who have experienced random acts of violence. We pray for victims of shooting at the supermarket in Buffalo and whatever led to that desperate act, we pray for those who, who are hurting and those who are mourning. We pray for an end to violence, that we would learn a different way of being, that we, through our lives, would live faithfully to your calling and your teaching, and that as we live out our lives, it influences the people with whom we connect who in, then ter in turn influence their circles, that together we might live so faithfully that your message of love would spread across all of humanity, that we would treat one another the way that you call us to, to care for each other in your name. We pray for those who are ill. We pray for those whose health situation is unknown right now to us, but known to you. Hold those who are healing and struggling in your care. Restore them to the wholeness that you long for us to each experience. Guide us, O oh God, with a love that is stronger than death itself, the love that restores life and hope that inspires us to seek out your desire for us and to serve one another, to serve your people. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us stand as you are able to sing, O God, who gives us life.
course was no. <laughs> and now in the method of Dr. Seuss, when we travel and when we're home, we will spread a message of love never alone. We will follow Jesus here and there. We will follow Jesus everywhere. We will carry God's love to the least of these. Help us, God, share your call for peace. Let us go forth in God's name, inspired by the Spirit, never the same. As a shared postlude, let us join in, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you. 